friends and gamers and welcome to Fortress. My name is Jinx and today I want to take a look at combat values. I made a combat values spreadsheet for HPG's Global War 1936 that lists all the units, all their attack values, their defense values, their movement values, and also a few other little things. And I find it a very handy unit as a perspective to give into the game. So I'm designing my own little game as well. It's probably going to be like a retirement <laughs> kind of project, something I just do in my free time, but I really enjoy it. And one of the tools I use for that is something like this combat spreadsheet. But I find it quite useful in playing the game too and have this realistic perspective of it. So I made this about a year ago and I've shared it actually in, in one of my other videos. I shared a quick screenshot about it as well. And in that, you know, I, I've, I've shared it with a few individuals, for instance, Bob Hatcher, who's working for HPG in, in the working of Global War 1914, asked me for a copy of it. So I shared it with him, and, and then he sent a copy back with, with all, all the values put in there for World War I. And I thought that was very interesting, too, and I find it's a very handy tool to working on board games and designing board games specifically, but as well as playing on board games. It gives you a very good perspective on how it's played. Okay, so that's basically what I'm thinking about showing you here. But before I do that, I'm going to go into and show you something else. I think it's important to sit, lay some proper groundwork before we deal with the spreadsheet itself. And that will be an Excel spreadsheet of a different kind. <laughs> I'll show you what that's all about. Here we go. So this is a table here, uh, an Excel spreadsheet. I quite like Excel. So here we have some values here. You have a combat, a mythical combat occurring. You have a certain number of tanks, a certain number of cavalry, and a certain number of militia. Let's see, um, well, I didn't list them on here, and perhaps that's something I should. But basically, each tank is attacking here. And each tank, as we know, would roll a dice 12, and they would succeed a, on a roll of a 6. So if you have, let's say, 5 tanks, so it's 5 times 6 gives you 30. You know, that's the combat value of 30, right? Each tank is rolling... Uh, is trying to get six or less, and so that's the combat power, is six or less. And so here we have it, um, the combat power is 30. Cavalry, yeah, you can spend a bit more money on cavalry than you can on tanks. You know, you could only get five tanks, but you can get 10 tank, uh, ten cavalry for that same dollar price. And cavalry, as you know, they attack at three. And so you have cavalry at a three, tank at a six, and since you have 10 cavalry, you're looking at a combat power of 30 in that stack of cavalry. And here we have militia that are attacking. Militia are attacking at a 15. Because you have you have 15 militia because you could spend two bucks for every militia. And so with uh, how much money did we say we had? We had 30 bucks to spend. And so with those 30 bucks, we could get 15 militia. So you see all these are the same price. Six, uh, five tanks will get you a combat power of 30. And it will cost you 30 as well to get those five tanks. You For uh, 30 bucks, you can get... 10 cavalry, and um, therefore you'd have a combat power of 30. And for 30 bucks, you can get 15 militia, and so 15 militia will get you 15 attack combat power. And I ran this through here on round one. If you average one hit suffered per round, you would lose your combat power at a steady kind of rate. And I want to show you what that looks like in this chart here. Okay, you see the chart here. You see how tanks are here in blue. They go from 30, the first unit they suffer drops them down to 24, to 18, to 12, to 6, to 0. And now they're gone. They only have 5 hits, basically, before they're a force of being. That means your 30 bucks that you spent on your tanks have basically vanished at that point, right? After 5 rounds. Cavalry has a bit more staying power because they have less combat power per hit, basically. They only have, you reduce their combat power by 3. So here we go 3, to 27, to 24, to 21, to 18, to 15. And you see they drop down here. The loser, basically, of this, if, you spend, if you're the loser that spends 30 bucks on 15 IPP and sends that combat stack to attack, well, initially you're going to have, you know, uh, your combat power is going to be 15 to 14 to 13 to 12 to 11 to 10 to 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. You see how they actually sur out-survive everybody else by taking one hit per round. Now, of course, that's a little bit deceptive. I'm just, by this, I'm just pointing out that they survive with five units at the end of that combat. But of course, you're not making as many hits, right? You know, the 30 up here, you're going to average, was it 2.5 hits, basically? If that's correct, yeah, roughly 2.5 hits for both cavalry and um, tanks per round. Yeah, that's what they're going to hit on, on attacking. 
but the militia is going to average one point, what is it, 1.2 hits per round. So you're going to be not, not taking as many of the enemy's units off as you are. So likely they're all going to go down on equal pace. But I just wanted to demonstrate to you that just because you have a stack of tanks and are going into a combat doesn't necessarily mean that you'll survive that combat. <laughs> you know, you only have five rounds to win that one. And it quickly balances out. You know, you see by the fourth round, <clears throat> you're on parity with the militia. And uh, the cavalry, it takes a little bit longer to get on parity with the militia, roughly round eight. And at round nine, at that point, the militia have more. But I just wanted to demonstrate with this that it's not as obvious as it is. Oh, that stank of German tanks are scary, yes. But it really depends on, on, on you know, it's, that's not all there is to the equation. Let's look at a defense. And so we're looking at roughly the same stuff. Instead of cavalry, we switched up with um, infantry, right? So here we have tanks. You have five tanks. So that's roughly 30 combat power. You have um, 10 infantry at three bucks each, which gives you 40 combat power because they defend at four. And you have 15 militia, so at 30. And you see this curve is a little bit more, well, it's a, it's a little bit more, right? So 30 to 30. So Tanks and militia now are equal in value. You had uh, two bucks for every uh, militia, right? So you still have 15, but they're defending at two as well. They're doing pretty good. They're on those five tanks are equal to 15 militia right there. And that's nice. That's really good. Militia are really good at defense in this case, right? And so you start off round one parity here with the infantry doing much better than everybody else. By round two, you see the tanks are rapidly dropping off. The militia though are creeping down slowly. Now keep in mind here you have the tanks are roughly going to hit 2.5 percent, uh, 2.5 hits per round, roughly the same as militia or the same as militia, whereas infantry are going to roll well at the very least three, if not four hits. Let's say 3.5 hits, so one hit more, or on average about one hit more than the tanks and the militia. And so they're going to take off a few of the enemy. But you see how the tanks rapidly drop off. The infantry are steadily kind of declining. And the militia, though, they out-survive the infantry. At here, at round six, they are on parity with the infantry and doing the same amount of damage as the infantry are, but suffering less hits. That's why militia might look really cheap. But in defense, they're super good. And actually, in, in attack, they're not too bad if you can survive enough rounds. So that's my thoughts behind this. This is why I want to share. It's not all about those high numbers that they roll. The tanks, they may roll a six, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. The infantry... Defending at a four, you know, that's good, but it's, it's again, it's that's not all there is in the picture. There's other stuff that aren't shown up in this equation as well. You know, this attack, tank, uh, this tank here, you might be able to throw another five tanks into this mix because they have a range of two. Same thing with the cavalry. You can have the tanks blitz as well, so that changes the equation as well. So it's not always obvious what's good and what's not. And I'm going to do my best to break it down to some degree, but I want you guys to know that even though I'm doing my best here, it will, there's much more to the picture than I can even explain. All right, let's move on to the spreadsheet itself. Here we have the spreadsheet. So we have land units, we have attack. This is basically on dice 12, what they have to roll to succeed. Ignore these top two for a moment. We'll, we'll get to them later on. Chance, this is chance on that dice 12 to succeed. So infantry attacks at a two and out of dice 12, that's about a 17% chance of hitting. Percentage per IPP spent. So. Roughly, for every IPP spent on an infantry, you have 5.6% chance of scoring a hit. So you have attack 2, which is 17% chance. If you divide 17 by 3, you get 5.6. Defense out of 4, which is 33% chance. If you divide that by IPP value, you get 11% chance of hitting for every IPP spent. Within a fourth, they're a bit better. They're at 50% because they're 4 plus 2 on the first round of combat. They're at 50% chance of hitting which is a whopping 16% per IPB spent. They also have one movement and they cost three. They're the best defensive unit in the game. Anytime I put a star, it means it's one of the best or something of note. You'll also notice that I have stuff in gold and kind of an orange color here. So gold is basically top tier. Top tier for, well, you know, 8.3 is top tier for attack. That's mostly the top, right? Um, <clears throat> it's one of the best ones is in gold. Orange is, is kind of second place, right? It's not the best unit in the game. And so that's basically the way I have it laid out. So let's start. Infantry, You've I've gone over all this as well. Best unit in the game. Artillery support bumps it up to 
This is ignoring the artillery present and just simply saying the infantry is boosted up. So it becomes the best unit in the game for attacking. 8.3. That might surprise you, but I'll show you later on how, what I mean by that. Militia, that's yeah, not that good an attack. 4.2, that's not that great. But 8.3 in defense, that's second tier, but not that bad. 11 is not bad at all for defense. That's the best one per, uh, you know, overall the best one for defensive unit. 33% chance in a fortress and in a fortified line, militia are the best. And in cities also, militia would probably bump this up from 8.3 to something kind of on parity with the infantry, I would expect. But within a fortified line, yeah, it would be really good. Best homeland defense unit. Now, <clears throat> cavalry here are at 3, which is 8.3, which is again quite good. That's a excellent top tier stuff. And overall, best unsupported attack unit. Motorized, they kind of, they're nothing too notable. The best thing about them is that they can tow artillery behind them, so get an extra movement out of it. And that's not bad. I believe, I could be wrong in this, I have to double check. No, I, I don't think artillery can support motorized, but um, yeah, but you can still have tow artillery. Maybe you can uh, boost artillery with, uh, boost motorized with artillery. In that case, yeah, then that would bump them up a little bit. Not as high as 8.3, but you'd be getting close. It'd be what, 5.6 or something like that, maybe a little better. Mechanized. Nothing too special about them, but keep in mind, mechanized is basically there to absorb hits from the tanks, uh, absorb hits for the tanks on behalf of the tanks. Artillery here are the artillery can artillery support and first strike. So that's one notable thing about artillery. You can score hits on the enemy before they score hits on you. So though they kind of fall in with if kind of a lower kind of value unit here with a 6.3 per IPP spent, it's still not that bad at all uh, because they can boost up your infantry. And self propelled artillery, well, their biggest thing is that they can move too. But otherwise, they, they kind of fall short of any kind of significance here. Now, let's look at these ones up here. Infantry and artillery, if you consider them as a, a unit paired together, like one unit essentially, or a pair of units, but taken into consideration as both, you have a, an attack at a three for infantry, an attack at a three for artillery, you're looking at a six. It also gets one for strike, right? that's not too bad, right? So 50% chance of one of these guys hitting, which if you break them up per IPB spent, so three bucks and four bucks is 7.1. So that's kind of second tier. Defense, at 8.3. That's not too bad. Within a fortified line, that's 13.1. But keep in mind that artillery behind a fort gets a plus two. So you're looking at a five. So a first strike at, you know, that would be, you know, at a 13%. That's not too bad whatsoever. It's probably a little less than that. It's artillery at a 10, you know, at a 10% in a fortified line. That's not too bad for doing a first strike. Now, infantry and advanced artillery bump these guys up to becoming one of the best units in the game. When you attack in the seven, it's considered as a paired unit. They also have like two hit points if you look at it that way. One is infantry, one is advanced artillery. So probably the best unit or the best pair of units in the game is infantry and advanced artillery. Defense at uh, 9.5. That's not too bad. And basically a guaranteed hit from one of them. <laughs> because you're looking at uh, both of them are being boosted up by that fort. So 15% per IPP spent, but 100% chance of a hit. That's really nice. Uh, this one has a 92, so one of them has a chance of hitting, almost guaranteed. Moving on, anti-air artillery is a little bit special because in the first round they could hit nice and high, right? So three at three at 75%. This is why in Operation Winter Solace, you know, when we were playing that game, at one point uh, Hilltop Pillbox attacked uh, Iran or southern Iran, and I gave him a list of how to take casualties first, and but I didn't consider that first strike that he hit me a few times first strike I thought it would be obvious to take off my militia for first strike but no he took off my anti-air artillery which really sucked because I could have gotten well I had a 75% chance of scoring a hit for each artillery and I had two in there I could have taken out some of his aircraft so I was pretty hot and bothered by that you know at my own foolishness but also at, at this concept of, of it would have been nice if Hilltop would have you know uh, set, uh, sent me a quick question saying hey just double checking is that what you want you know this situation might come up where i do a first strike because yeah i gave him a list of casualties but without thinking about the first strike so it was on me but one of those things that would have never showed up if i was at the table anyways sorry <laughs> so that's a whopping 19 percent chance for every ipp spent and you're spending four ipps right so yeah 75 percent chance for each anti-air to hit that's really good 
they have a defense again of the same thing, roughly 75% chance here, right? So it's a attack and defense. Actually, I don't know about the attack, but definitely the defense. Um, in a fortified line, that's 125% chance of a hit, you know, and they get three rolls there. So looking at that for every IPP spent, that's a 31% chance of a hit. So that works out to 125%. That's really excellent, right? You know, you're guaranteed almost two hits for every anti-air behind a fortified line. Moving on, tank destroyers, nothing too significant. The big thing with them is they can target the select vehicle class. So not too bad, but at a 5.0% for attack, you know, they're better than militia, but not better than infantry. They're for defense, you know, they're not even as good as militia and they're not better than most of anything else. So basically a little bit on attack, maybe behind a fortified line, maybe, but you know, not that good of a unit for tank destroyer, especially out of five, right? Light armor, really, uh, not too shabby for attack, right? 8.3, that's not too bad. It's the same as cavalry. The issue is you can get the same thing for cavalry at a cheaper cost, and, and you, you could save yourself a dollar, and that hit point is saved because they don't have a blitz or anything like that. So cavalry, it's better. Maybe if you're looking a little bit more on defense than you think about having a light armor, but at the most, most oftentimes I'd say, go cavalry, guys, go cavalry, 100%. Cavalry is excellent. I would say cavalry is overpowered. And the one thing I would say HBG should do is limit the purchase of cavalry to two per turn. I think they're I think they're too valuable. And I would, you know, I've conducted German attacks against Russia exclusively with cavalry with not even a single tank and been quite successful in that. So cavalry should be limited to two per turn. It's not like we're working in, in Napoleonic era or anything like that. <clears throat> That's just my two cents. Medium armor. <clears throat> Medium armor can be a little bit deceptive here because they look really good. You know, they're out of six, right? You know, they're six out of 12. That's 50% chance. And they're gold star right here for that. If you have a landing and you really need to win quickly or whatever, or you need to push in there and, and win within one round, yeah, you might want to bring in a couple tanks. Or if you're trying to defend a territory and you have a minor factory and you really need to get some high powered defensive units out there, yeah, you want a medium armor. That's 8.3, that's really good per IPB spent. For defense, it's out of 42, you know, the best throughout the whole game for defensive value. 6.9, not so good, but again, if you only have one unit to produce in that territory, or two, let's say, I'd build two medium armor over two militia. Even though militia gets a little bit better in defense, you still get a nice, solid 42% chance for their role. So if you're limited by the amount of factories, that's what you gotta do. It's got Blitz, which is another thing worth considering. Blitz is absolutely excellent to really put the fear of, fear of the, well, <laughs> fear of something anyways in, in, in the hearts of your enemies. And a, you got a good hit chance unit. So that's a fantastic unit in that regards. So <clears throat> um, these are tech units here. Heavy armor, you know, heavy armor. Yeah, it's got this big 67. Maybe I should have put that in gold as well, but it's still got an 8.3 attack for IPP spent. Not that good. Um, likewise, it's got a 58% chance over here. So again, similar situations, if you were to build them under, you know, if, if you're in a tough spot, you could of course build them for defense here. So best hit chance unit throughout the whole game. You know, it's an excellent unit in that regards. But if you have time and if you have the production capacity, get some cavalry instead. You know, they cost eight. Um, you can get the same attack value per combat um, dice. You know, you just buy a couple, you know, you buy how many of these do you need? One, two, or three. That you can get three of them for nine bucks, whereas this one costs you eight bucks. And so each one for IPP spent is eight point three, whereas this would get you, you know, it's still eight point three, right? You get kind of the picture there. Advanced artillery is excellent on its own. It's fantastic at eight point three. On its own defense, it's excellent. In the fortified line, it's it's beautiful, and it can still artillery support, and it can still first strike. So artillery, advanced artillery is fantastic but the best unit in game is advanced mechanized they have attack at 33 percent chance at an 8.3 hit hit percent chance for ipp spent same as cavalry they can blitz on their own i believe which is fantastic i don't have that here i should have put that on there for defense they're they're amazing at defense at 10.4 that's as good as infantry right you have to pay four bucks for them but for one buck extra and the ability to attack yes absolutely Advanced mech is the way to go. In my opinion, they're fantastic. And move to, and if you can blitz with them, that's all the better, right? Just the best unit overall in game. This is the golden child of the whole thing. This is what everybody should aim for, in my opinion. These techs are really good to get behind. Of course, keep in mind they are locked behind techs, but if you start the techs early enough, 
you can uh, you can definitely get them and and have them present in the combat. Let's look at AA uh, aircraft units. <clears throat> so, inherent AA fire. I thought I'd throw this in there for factories. It's a twenty five percent chance of hitting per every aircraft attacking. That's not too bad, right? Air transport. I threw it in there just because. Why not? You can carry one air unit. Seaplane. Seaplanes are garbage. <laughs> they're a useless unit. I bless their hearts at HPG, but I like the, having the variety and such, but seaplanes, I would I'd never build a seaplane. They attack at 25% chance, 3.6% hit ratio. You can only hit submarines and transports with them. Uh, defense at 1, 8.3. You know, it's, it's pretty horrible all across the board. You have a fighter, 6. Much better chance. You know, you could use them to hit submarines too, of course, right? So 6, 50% chance, a 5.0% chance for IPP spent, and a 50% chance defense. It's the same attack and defense, right? But overall, really good. Um, not too bad at all. Intercept at 3 and air superiority, which means that you can, uh, you can take out other aircraft on that first round of combat. So fighter is probably the best air unit per, uh, you know, air unit in the game. Tactical bombers are good too. They got the target selection and the blitz capacity, so that's awesome. Uh, but still 5.3 per IPP spent as opposed to 5.0. So not that big of a distance between the two. They defend poorer than aircraft as well. And they don't have interception and air superiority, but they do have this target selection, which is quite nice. But if you're playing an army and you're fielding more cavalry instead of your medium armor or heavy armor, then yeah, I think you can forego getting tactical bombers because they only come up, they only are needed really only once in a while. It's nice to have a tactical bomber. For the most part, I think I prefer fighters. You know, if you look at it this way, tactical armors can target select, yeah, but in some ways, fighters are target selecting on the first round of combat anyways with their air superiority. If they get a hit, it's automatically taking, and, and you know, they have a much more decent chance of getting a hit. You're taking out something with a lot more value, either fighters or tactical bombers, medium bombers, strategic bombers. You're taking out something with a lot of weight behind it, something worth 10 bucks as opposed to six bucks. You know, if you're using your target selection here to go after medium armor, it's only six, but you can use your air superiority rolling at six to actually take out, you know, another fighter worth 10. So you get more bang for your buck for your fighters. And the distance travel is the same anyways, right? So, yeah, that's my two cents on the matter. You defend better, you attack marginally better, uh, less, but you got this air superiority to make up for your loss of target selection. And they might even get blitz. I'm not too sure about that, right? Uh, but interception at three is nice too. Medium bomber, well, they're not too bad at for price for um, attack per IPP, 5.3. Defend really badly. They could do some bombing, though, which is nice. So, yeah, not the greatest, but, you know, they're not bad against submarines. I'd rather get <clears throat> a medium bomber rolling at 7 against submarines who can't hit back over a seaplane that rolls a 3 against uh, submarines. It's more, much more versatile. you got much more range. And realistically, you don't quite need the range of the seaplane anyways. And can seaplanes even use the air bases? <clears throat> can seaplanes even use air bases? I'm not even sure. Now, I would say that I would build a seaplane if we're playing with the rule that I could do mine warfare. That makes them a little bit better. I'd build one as Germany and persistently mine the enemy. I think that would be quite handy. Force them to spend a little bit more resources. <laughs> That's what I do. The only time I build a seaplane. Medium bomber. Yeah, we've covered that. Strategic bomber. This is quite good in some sense. If you're using them against land forces, well, 4.2, that's not great. I wouldn't go for that one necessarily. Maybe it is a separate combat, so you could probably use this if you want to kind of thin out the enemy a little bit. Not too bad. Big thing with them is airborne assault. I quite like that. So I like having these guys for the airborne assault. I think it's quite handy. Now, with the tech units here, heavy bombers, 5 at 2, a 6.4. That's better than all the other units here. So 6.4 is not too bad. It's better than tactical bomber, medium bomber, and fighter. Worthwhile considering. Everything else is more or less marginal and uninteresting, except the 3 dice 6 for bombing. Now you lose the airborne assault. So sometimes sometimes I wonder, I, sometimes I like the versatility of having the airborne assault. It keeps the, the fear, fear in the enemy a little bit. It projects your power. It does that power projection. And um, so I like the airborne assault almost a little bit more than, than the 3 dice 6. Just my two cents on it, but I could be wrong. Jet fighter, 5.6. So it is better than the fighter here. It costs, you know, 5.6 per IPB spent. You know, still at the end of the day, because it costs two bucks more, I think I'd rather, I personally would stick with just having fighters. That's just my way of doing things. 
It takes another tech slot, and I'd rather use the tech slot for advanced mech or advanced artillery. I'd keep, uh, you know, I probably wouldn't get jet fighters. And sure, it's a little bit better, but not that much better. And not, you know, not for the, the time spent to get it. Interception at five is really nice, though. I will grant you that. That makes it much more appealing. If I was playing as somebody that was being hammered by strategic bombing, then I would look at this very fondly. Okay, naval units get really more interesting. Coastal subs, nothing too special. Yeah, the combat. So I, I've switched from doing attack and defense to simply just combat. Now, sub, uh, naval units do something a little bit different too because they have cost and improved cost via tech. So that changes things a bit, which changes this equation here too. So uh, hmm, there should be something else. Oh yeah, so this is combat chance per IPP at the base cost. This is at the new cost. I should explain that. This is movement. These are the hit points they have. So, coastal submarines, they combat two, 17% chance. You can't build them, move one, can't be milled, multiple special rules. So, good subs, slow. Torpedo boats, 70%, nothing too special. Coastal defense, six, 50% chance of scoring a hit. Not too bad. It's hard to calculate them to uh, IPP value because they don't have an IPP value here. So one and one, these would likely be the first casualties these up here because you can't build them. Um, I do like the coastal defense ship if I'm just holding in place and blocking an area. Naval transports, well, they cost seven, they cost six, but they have no combat value, so I can't calculate that in there. Attack transports, I'm marking down here as well. Submarines, Co combat at three, 4.2, after adjusted for the improved costs or improved construction, so it's 5.0, multiple special rules. Destroyer, it's good, 4.8. Now, the, the naval numbers don't get too high over here. Pair with uh, maritime air patrol to attack subs. Negate sub first strike. So you need subs, you need destroyers, and you need light cruisers. The light cruisers roll at 5, which is a 42% chance, which is a 5.2% chance for IPP spent. The best for all naval units. After you improve them, they go up to 6.9. That's better than all the other rest of the units. In the game they also have a nice little shore bombardment unfortunately they don't have um you, know, you can't maritime air patrol with them right but there's still and you can't negate the sub for strike so you need these three units at the very least to have a good game in my opinion as japan that's why you throw down a pile of these especially after you get improved construction and boom bob's your uncle and even if you don't that's still not too bad for the price spent you know better than all the other units combined heavy cruisers they do have this ability for mine warfare likewise with submarines here so if you're playing with that rule you might want one or two heavy cruisers just to you know just to do something with them but you have your submarines for that as well so you don't really need them they're a little bit well i would probably ignore these i'd rather have the hit points you know you save a buck eight ten you save two bucks here for getting a light cruiser and you get a better bang for your buck as well for ipv spent so that's my two cents on the matter Unless, of course, you're pressed because you don't have much uh, production capacity and you need to get some high-powered stuff out fast, then yeah, you'd go this way. Alternatively, battle cruiser also works good for that. Um, nothing too special with them. Battleships are interesting because they got the two hit points. So those are a little bit harder to calculate. You can get you know, um, a 67% chance of hitting, which is a 4.4. So it's less than, than even your battle cruiser, heavy cruiser. It's Almost as good as your submarines, a battleship, right? You know, it, they're a little bit better than your submarines, but not that good. But the fact that they got two hit points muddies up the waters. And once you get them at five point, you know, once you get improved construction, then they get much better than submarines, right? So that's not too bad because you got three stages of production. That increases this uh, quite nicely as well. So two hit points plus a shore bombardment makes the battleship much more appealing. In my opinion, I think they're actually not too bad in that case. Fast battleship. No, I don't think I'd go for fast battleships. They can move. Oh, I got this backwards. It should be a two here and a three here. Um, yeah, fast battleships are good, but I don't think the price difference is worth it, in my opinion. They cost, what do they cost? 15 as opposed to 13. With the improved tech, and before it was 18 to 15. So a three buck difference, I don't know. It's only three bucks, so maybe I would. Maybe I would just to get them to keep up with everything else, but. You still need your destroyers. Uh, they move three as well. Okay, you still need your your naval transports. So that's really case by case basis. But I'm not sure about the fast battleship, light carrier. They can only defend. So here's why it's in green at 8.3. I'm 
two here. So you're not really looking at them for your combat values. Their biggest thing is they can carry aircraft. And yeah, nothing too special behind them. They're interesting and they're good, but nothing too special. I like I like the cost of them here at 12 and 6. You know, for me, when I look at this, is like, okay, so once I get the tech, or even before I get the tech, two light carriers almost equal the value of one fleet carrier. And you get two hit points out of it, right? You know, eight and eight is 16. You're only saving one buck difference by going for the fleet carrier. And you can have um, two very versatile platforms. So I'd almost go, I'd almost go for two light carriers just for the two hit points. Of course, you get two hit points here as well, but you can't diversify and you can't split your forces as easy. So it's, it's a case by case basis again too, but just something to look at. All right, moving on to the tech level stuff. Heavy balance ship, they roll at 10. So the best unit per game, right? In that sense of rolling heavy. So if you're again under time constraint and, and the Americans are bearing down on Japan and you really need to pump out a ship, even though it takes you three turns, <laughs> you could theoretically get a heavy battleship to just really throw that big heavy punch of a 10. But, you know, I think at that price, I'd rather go for a couple light cruisers if possible. You know, two or three light cruisers, because still at 4.8 per, uh, what is it, 4.0 per IPB spent. Uh, sorry, I don't know, I'm scrolling up. That's a 5.2. I'd rather go for, you know, two or three light cruisers as opposed to, how much would that be? Six, six, and six? Yeah, three light cruisers out of 5.2 or one heavy battleship rolling one dice at 10. You know, you have a 15 combat power or a 10 combat power. You have three hit points each. Yeah, for the same price. So I don't think I'd ever go for heavy battleship. It just doesn't make sense to me. Advanced submarines, well, they are pretty good. 4.8 is not that bad. A step up from 4.2. They're equal on par with destroyers at that point. Light cruisers, you know, they're not too bad whatsoever. And keep in mind, you're at a 5.6 over here. So you're keeping up with the destroyers. They're basically a destroyer in the water that the enemy can't hit because your advanced submarines, they can only hit you on their turn and not on your own. So you can pass underneath. How's that work? You can pass underneath maritime air patrol. I can't remember exactly, but you get the scoop. Maybe it's you can pass underneath destroyers. You So advanced subs are pretty good. And heavy carrier, well, nothing stands out with them for me. 0 0.9 for combat value. You're not looking at combat value with them. That's not where it's at. You're mostly looking at the ability to carry three aircraft. But again, at 15 bucks, just get yourself three light carriers and you're done. Or get yourself one light carrier and one, um, one fleet carrier and now you can carry three units and you have three hit points as well. Basically, there's other things you can do just to diversify and spread your forces. I think it's just more one of those glamour kind of research text to do and I would I would never go for heavy carrier I would probably never go for heavy battleship because keep in mind which is more valuable heavy battleship or do you want to get advanced mech and advanced artillery do you want to go for um, heavy carrier or do you want to go for attack transports so at the end of the day the text I would go for would be if I'm playing Germany advanced submarine if I'm playing Japan probably attack transports but that's it you know, um, America can afford to go for attack transports and advanced submarines. But, you know, yeah, it's a case by case basis, nation to nation. These ones here. So I'm going to say overall what I would get. Depends who you're playing, of course. But overall, the best tech in the game is advanced artillery and advanced mech. Those are the best techs throughout the whole game. If I had three techs to choose from, I probably would go f when it comes to related to, to units. I'd say these two and maybe attack transports but that's about it maybe not attack transports maybe advanced submarines depending on who i was playing of course improved construction is the best one to choose before you go for any one of these ones before you go for those ones go for improved construction and that's it if i only had three tech choices improved construction advanced mech and um you know a war economy or something like that i think that would be the way to go that's my two cents guys and that is my <laughs> combat value spreadsheet so i hope you learned something i hope it's somewhat educational to you guys and and uh you learn something from it i use this in my board game as well that i'm designing and um i find it very useful to crack it down here to the number level and the trick is it's not as obvious as simply calculating everything to combat value per ipb spent you have to consider move you have to consider the fort defense you have to consider you know if you're pressed for time you have to consider all these different factors behind it as well 
you of course you could you could buy the best unit against aircraft in game here at ninety percent per IPP spent, but is that going to help you out, right? So everything has to be taken with a, a grain of salt and a little bit of understanding. The situation is just not numbers and uh, what's it called? Um, bean counters. It's not all about bean counting and such. When it comes to the tactical aspect in the field, the strategic perspective, it gets a little bit more complex than that. And that's it, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed. Cheers.